I'd like to welcome those who are joining us for 2013 Feast of Unleavened Bread. And uh, before we get started, I'd like everyone to please uh, approach in an attitude of worship and prayer to our King and remembering we are here to honor his sacrifice for us and to learn more of his work, his divine work that we can partake of in our lives. Okay, friends, uh, welcome in to this 2013 Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yes, it's one of the, it's actually the first of the three pilgrimage festivals. And uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, every year, well, three times per year, uh, all the males are commanded to appear before Yahweh, and they are to appear assembled in the correct fashion under the ensign of their father's house. That's where heraldry comes from, is from Israel, and it says they're reckoned by genealogy under the ensign of their father's house. And that many times it is commanded to have it at your dwelling place, and have it especially at the three pilgrimage festivals. Okay, and uh, there's at least uh, the four main banner tribes you have in the north, Dan, the camp of Dan, which two tribes go under him. Uh, some people are, are equating that with the North, Scandinavian three tribes. We do here as well. There's over 2,000 books on the subject that we can readily make available to you if you would like to receive them. And in the East, you have the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, the Lion of the tribe of Judah is uh, depicted in the East. He is. Uh, where the, the predominant amount of the house of Judah remain to this day. And then you have in the south, you have the three tribes who fall under the Latin people. And in the far west, you have the Anglo people. Praise Yahweh, the Anglo people who stretch far west, that multitude of mighty nations, who have been given the name Israel when Jacob crossed his arms and placed his name only on those two tribes. Yes, uh, the name Israel can only be claimed by the ox people, the actual people who in their heraldry they have two horns and that they will push the nations and they are uh, the most mult multitudinous, the most uh, richest and there's many other covenants about what they would do as being the most powerful people in the world as a nation and continuing as a nation finally to seek first his kingdom law governance on earth as it is in heaven. Right now, Yahweh says he will not come back. He will not come back until, and it says the end will not come until we've been a witness of the whole kingdom that is his whole law governance on earth. And he will not come back until it says we be a witness of that full kingdom governance of all of his law in the house of Israel, the northern kingdom with ten tribes. House of Judah is separate from the house of Israel and they don't even have the name Israel. They have the scepter, a very important and the scepter people have ruled on the throne of David in every generation. They've been coronated like the last queen of England. Well, they, the archbishop proclaims queen of Israel. And that is in all the historical uh, catalogs that the stone that she was sitting upon under her throne was the David's uh, stone of scone fulfilling the continual prophecies and there are it says the seed of David multiplied but there's also a breach in the house of Judah it says that there was a breach between the two sons of Judah one who was first born who had the right they tied a scarlet cord around his arm and he went back into the womb and when he went back into the womb he brought that, he was only partially born. 
he went back in the womb, and then Pharez was born first, and he became uh, the, the king of, of Judah in the east. But Zara went to the west and founded the Trojan empires and the, the Italian nation. You know, we've heard of Hercules, and we've heard of Memnon, and we've heard of all these great uh, royals, and they're, all of their genealogies are cataloged in Sweden and in England and major royal artifacts showing you yes the Irish people, the English people, uh, their nobility. In Denmark they have these stones that are the most important part of their right to rule, of their government for over a thousand years. Okay, And it traces back to these Trojan royalty all the way back to Scarlet Cord of Judah. You, people have heard of the Knights of the Scarlet Thread. In Ulster, Northern Ireland, they actually have the Scarlet Cord heraldry with the red hand symbolizing their right to rule through Zara. And I believe that the breach was ended when Jeremiah brought the Pharaoh's line queen daughters to Ireland. That's in the annals of England, I. R. Bunnell, and his data grave is in Ireland to this day. That is a part of Irish history, and he brought the throne with him, and then it passed to Scotland eventually, and Longshanks eventually overtook it. It says there would be three overturns. First it went to Ireland, then it went to, yes, the throne itself, the stone that David anoint well Jacob anointed and David was given promises concerning that throne that his seed would rule upon it in every generation. So 500 BC Judah was destroyed in the east. The, they were completely taken into captivity. The king's daughters were killed. The king no, the, the daughters the daughters were to let live it says and but the uh, sons were killed. That was the end of it. Some say that there was an uncle who still survived out there, and that's fine. But the Zara branch likes to say, well, the breach was fixed. All right. The descendants of Judah down through Sparta. There's an article we're about to publish, very much cataloging uh, the articles and the letters that they wrote. It's recorded in the book of Second Maccabees. It's recorded in the book of Jasher, which were divine, biblically inspired books in our scripture. And even the historian Josephus recataloged and requoted our people in Troy and in Sparta as they were writing and, and having full letters, official documents of their government to the high priests of Israel reaffirming their descendancy in Israel through the house of the royal senior tribe of Judah. And they continue to confirm such claims and Josephus, one of the most accurate and well uh, first century historians, one of the most uh, well uh, researched and proven historians of the first century uh, even um, has uh, full descriptions of the seals that were involved and so forth uh, on the actual official documents and these are and were responded to by Judah and they said well we fully have known this all along and we know no one needs to give you such a great introduction on your ancestry we know that your the major uh, breach tribe of Judah. And it does say that there would be a breach in Judah and that one day it would be restored. <laughs> the Orthodox Jews don't understand why three times a day they turn to Jerusalem and they pray that prayer that Judah would be regathered from the four corners of the earth. Right now the four corners of the earth are occupied by Judah, the royal tribe doesn't matter if you want to claim the pure Judah 
people of South Africa or the northeastern corners of the earth or the northwestern corners of the earth or the southeastern corners. Southeast was the most farthest southeast corner. Australia was the most farthest northeast corner. Russia, actually about 80% of the east coast of Asia is Russia. Northwest goes without saying, we know all that corner there. Okay. So uh, that breach is well known and uh, we are to um, pray for the four corners of the earth that his true seed would be regathered and that's what we do. Not only the Orthodox Jews do it three times a year. We're also to pray such prayers. That the breach, if you don't believe it's already been fixed, that, it, that Judah would be restored and a government would be put under, that they would make a government. Actually, at this stage, there is only an atheist state in Zion, in the actually Zionist state. And uh, so, really, it all goes on key that there needs to be a government for Judah. And I believe it's only going to come about, and there will be a nat national, uh, Judah was never divorced. Only the house of Israel was divorced. And when he, so they remain married to, to our Heavenly Father, although there was a breach. But you see, House of Israel, the ten tribes, were divorced. And they were, they, it says in the scriptures, they went mostly northwest. Some went east, mostly Judah and some other related Hebrew tribes. But, it says, yes, these people... Yes, I'm getting into this dissertation on these tribes because this is a part of the assembly for Israel, this pilgrimage, every year, three times a year. People need to know what they're praying for. Okay? And we're praying for his, the, the kingdom of Judah to be restored. And we're praying for the kingdom of Israel to be restored. We're praying not only for these kingdom governments because he said, seek first my kingdom and my governance on earth as it is in heaven, right? That's a word to pray daily. Okay, his kingdom is law governance and uh, it's not been fulfilled. 70% of the law, the law of Moses, is national law, which has not been fulfilled. No, not, not one, not even a... a a fraction has been fulfilled not till now it's written on our hearts and we love his law and we want to keep it now it says if they don't keep my commandments and they say they know who God is as I'm quoting you from 1st John it says if they don't keep his commandments but they say they know me they are liars and the truth is not in them okay his word his law is the way we know him he says that we wouldn't be persuaded though one rose from the dead the only way you're persuaded is by the law. So I'll let people uh, think and pray about that one for a moment as we go into a bit of intermission. Okay, we're gathered together here. Feast of Unleavened Bread, 2013. First feast of the three pilgrimage feasts first high holy day of the seven high holy days, first month on the Hebrew calendar, in unison with many other assemblies worldwide, although many are not on the sacred Hebrew calendar, but are on the old Jewish pre-calculated calendar, and they're on an exception. Otherwise, there are some who are on starting to follow the new moon cycles, which is more biblical. Uh, we don't consider the new moon a, a high holy day, but the, it is a time to below the trumpet. Uh, but it is uh, being miscalculated in the, in the regards of they're not basing it on the first new moon after the equinox. And so there can be all these exceptions and uh, problems that it can have. So with the least amount of problems, and actually there's no problems with the calendar we follow, uh, which is the most Hebrew biblical calendar and you can read up more about it if you actually want to be confirmed 
you are on the best possible calendar, you can go to biblicalcalendar.org and there's some great studies there. But let's proceed uh, with those who are with us uh, for this uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yahweh is doing great things in the earth every year. He says that, uh, well, there will be an early rain and a latter rain, and he foretold that of his outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It says that the latter rain will be more anointing and more power. That is the latter church. You think the first century church had it. They even had animal sacrifices, and you know, Paul was actually going out and keeping the animal sacrifices, if you read Acts 25, and Yeshua kept animal sacrifices, our king, okay, and they didn't have any problem with, uh, they, okay, the main problem is if you say it's for salvation, all right, it's not for salvation, but Paul was dealing with he had to argue against people who said the only way you can be saved is by animal sacrifices. You see, that was the problem. And he was also having to deal with people who said the only way you can be eligible for salvation is if you first kept all the law of Moses perfectly. But, you see, that's reverse order. We first freely receive salvation through the sinner's prayer, confessing that we repent and turn away from all sin. So then you're sealed once and for all permanently as being born from above. Okay, you're, you're sealed. Nothing can add to that, okay, but that's spiritual salvation. Spiritual, we are a three-part being, spirit and soul and body. You still have to renew your mind. You still have to daily renew your mind in his word and it says cleanse your mind and grow in his truth and so forth that's the sanctification work that goes on in your soul and it says the way you know him and the way you are going to grow in it is by meditating in his law and delighting in his law day and night like Paul said the, in the inward man delights in the law of Yahweh it's only the flesh that hates the law and we have to get rid of the flesh but today we're going to cover the subject of restoring honor. Yes, uh, the fifth commandment that Yahweh wrote with his own finger on tablets of stone, the fifth commandment reads, and it comes with a blessing, honor thy father and thy mother. Okay? And it says the blessing is that you will live long on the earth if you do so. But the honoring is not on worldly standards of honoring. Everyone, if you think deep down in your heart, deep down in your soul, honor is sin, honor. And think deep down in your heart, is uncleanness, is that honor? Think deep down in your heart. All right. Is dishonor that's going on in society and being enforced by political extremists, radical extremists, to enforce that you must celebrate uncleanness? Is that honor? No one, I think, at all will ever think that you can equate honor together with uncleanness. Okay? The way to really honor is going to be only Yahweh's standard. Yahweh's standard and His Word. He that hath my commandments keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. People like to skip from commandment one, love Yahweh. And they skip that one, and they just go to commandment two, love your neighbor, and they think that's going to be good. But no, the only way you can go, you can't skip over commandment one and go to commandment two. You go from commandment one, keeping all the commandments, then you love him. Then you can go to commandment number two, which will be 
like like the book of Leviticus, when Jesus said, love your neighbor, he was quoting from Leviticus. You know what it says in Leviticus? Love your neighbor is when you rebuke your neighbor. All right? That's the biblical definition of love your neighbor. It's from Levitical law. They never went against Levitical law in the New Testament. They said, well, the high priest has now changed. Yahweh is now our lamb. We're, we are celebrating Yeshua to be our eternal. There are many types of sacrifices, too. You have uh, meal offerings. You have uh, all sorts of... Uh, you have the, the full uh, burnt offering and so forth. There's many. There's a sin offering. There's so many different... There's the once in the year offering and the Holy of Holies. Okay, and when you learn the feast, you learn how he fulfilled each part of the sacrifices for us. And without him being our high priest ministering for us, like it says in the book of Hebrews, we'd be, all be toast. But for people who've now rejected him to be their savior, he's no longer our national deity and so forth. Well, what they're going to do is they're all going to go back under the old law and all the curses that were in the old law for those who do not keep the law. Because the only way we are saved is through Yeshua. All right? But if nationally people are speaking out against him and saying, we reject him, we reject his commandments, we reject everything about him being our savior, all right? Because people can go on in their ignorance. They've said the sinner's prayer. They can go on about their lives and say, well, I forgot that I turned and repented from all sin. I forgot about that one. Well, it's possible they might slide by. But if at one time in their life they have said the sinner's prayer, they've turned from sin. They've turned and repented of it. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4 tells us what sin is. It says sin is the transgression of the law. There's no other definition of sin. It's not rebellion against Yahweh that you can say, oh, now that's okay, and that's now uh, the good thing to do. You see, it says, woe unto them who call what is evil is good and what's good is evil. We're to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. We're to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. He says, fear Yahweh and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. All right? So we're just doing what's our basic duty. Yeshua said, if you've done everything that's commanded of you perfectly, just say you're an unprofitable servant, you've only done that which is your duty to do. We're just at the basic, minimum, bare duty, what we are to do as believers. And it says you keep the commandments that you might live. And when Paul, in Acts 15, he said they need to keep all of the, these dietary laws and the blood laws and the all these Levitical laws, and he said, just so you can do well in the earth. He didn't say it's for your salvation. That was a given. Everybody knows salvation was a given. He said, it's so you do well in the earth. All right? Eternal salvation has nothing to do with law keeping. If you want to do well in the earth, and if you want to be blessed, it says he'll make you, and he'll cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth if you call the Sabbath a delight. All right? And he'll feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. I mean, these are awesome, powerful uh, blessings that you can... No, no one in the world ever can even reach in a dream what levels these are. And it says that people... It says that the unbelievers, they will see that the table Yahweh prepares for us, that love him and our cup runs over, you know, with blessings and with great uh, things to go in it. And we're blessed in the city, it says, and we're blessed wherever we go. And it says that the wicked will see it and be grieved. They will gnash their teeth and they will melt away. All right. So we're gathering together for this uh, feast and it's a, a good uh, celebratory time. Of course, we're celebrating a, that in another about another day, our king resurrects from the grave. And the great uh, time that that heralds. He purchased for us his perfection. He overcame. And we're going to have communion services that will cover this. Uh, and uh, get us into these only 
true, honorable things. And I want to remind everyone it's important to take the communion because he said if you don't eat my flesh and if you don't drink my blood you have no life in you. Okay? If he is the most perfect, flawless, divine, spiritual tree of life, come and reveal, reveal to us. He is deity. He's not a man, like people say. He's not some prophet. He is deity. No one else made such a claim. He is Yahweh incarnate. The Elohim of Israel, the only God that's ever visited this earth. And he wrote his commandments with his finger. And today we're getting into commandment number five. And we need to get our, our definitions right here. What is true honor? All right. He said, those who are ashamed of my word in this sinful and adulterous generation that when I come in the glory of my Father with all my holy angels, I will be ashamed of you. We shouldn't be, <laughs> I mean, we should be totally honored by his word and loving his word, okay? Heaven forbid anyone would be ashamed of even one word of his. He is eternal Yahweh Elohim. He was there, he wrote with his finger the Ten Commandments. He gave the law to Moses. He's the second person, the eternal, of the divine eternal trinity, Yahweh Elohim. Some people don't like the word trinity. Well, spirit and soul and body, you have three parts. You want to say Yahweh only has two? Go for it. We're all turned inside out right now, but you'll see how, how many parts of our body we have. There's multiple heads and everything. There's multiple parts of, if you're interdimensional, <laughs> It says in your spirit, what's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you have four major faces and bodies that are supposed to work together in harmony and perfect balance. And in psychology, there's four major character types. You have the ox type, the choleric. Okay? You can go through all the, all the different types. Sorry, the, the ox. The ox is more the, the, the introvert uh, serving. The lion is the, the choleric, the more dictator type person. The man faces the more soul, a good emotion, feeling, righteousness in the, in the beliefs and in the attitudes. The eagle in the north, it all goes in order and it's all in perfect balance. We are to have all four character types. Some people don't understand you because you're in one or the other. If someone's an eagle person character type, well, and I can get into the technical terms all later, which all the psychology books use. And the best ones really base everything on it. But the eagle is more the analytical person. You know, if, he's, if you're more of like, let's say, a, you lean more towards the lion analytical, you're not going to understand the emotional or the server. So when someone's in full balance, you know, imagine what they're going to think about that person. But uh, what they have to do is be caring and over time get to know them, talk with them, ask them questions, don't assume. See how loving they are and actually the most uh, successful people have all four character types in full balance and that's exactly what the most what the scripture tells us to do. It says their wings will all be touching and when you go to the, the west they all move to the west. If you go to the north they all move together and their wings are still touching in harmony. Okay. And uh, so <laughs> that's just a passing point. You get free. Uh, but yes, um, we are to teach these things because it says this is what you are in the spirit, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. There were three parts of the tabernacle. And Moses, it says, made it after the pattern of the things in the heavens like Yahweh commanded. All right? If you don't believe that there's three parts of, of Yahweh able to be, Paul went to the third heaven. Elijah and went up into heaven. Uh, Enoch went up into heaven. All right? It says uh, in the books of Enoch that there are 12 heavens. All right? How are you going to live in all these heavens? It says that his train fills the heavens. All right? So there has to be at least three parts of, of Yahweh. 
and uh, it tells us in the scripture. All right, be baptized. I'm not just going to get into one because people want to nitpick one, but there's 10 or 20 that actually say all three parts. Of one, you're one person, just like he said, I and my father are one, and I wish that you would be one with Yahweh. You can be one with Yahweh through the power of the Ruach HaKadosh who fills us, the Holy Spirit. You can be one with him. So praise Yahweh, he, he's made that possible. And yes, uh, so we are to honor him and all, all, of, all of his word, not to be ashamed of even one word, all right? True honor, people are calling dishonor in these. And true dishonor, people are calling honor in this sinful and adulterous generation. Which one are you going to pick? Which one's going to win in the end? Truth always prevails. It says the light goes out in the darkness. <laughs> and nothing stops the light. Nothing. Doesn't matter how many Christians are killed. Doesn't matter how many times they burn them all at the stake. Doesn't matter how many times they try to overtake the priesthood of the Coldy orders of Yahweh. And all the other priests were independents. All the other nonconformist ministers, the dissenter churches of England, Seventh Day Baptist churches, that were the congregants were killed. If you had a Bible, you were burned at the stake. All right. It doesn't matter how many times the popes declared crusades on the Sabbath-keeping Waldensians and other people who keep the commandments, the inquisitions that they've had. It doesn't matter how many times state governments pass laws against Sabbath keeping. They've done it hundreds of times where they actually pass a law that says you can't keep the Sabbath. Alright? You can get catalogs of this because Sabbath keeping connects you to Yahweh. It says he's called the seventh day holy, not the first day. He rose on the seventh day. It says he was already gone from the grave on the seventh day, so don't anybody tell me that he rose on the first day of the week and that now we can pick and choose which day it is. You might be able to pick and choose man's days but it says Yahweh's day he changeth not. He and his word is eternal and not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law even after heaven and earth passes away. In Acts 25 the situation in Acts 26 and 27 he says, I'm being accused because I'm going and reaching out to the 12 tribes, which they called the Gentile nations, Ethnos and Greek, Gentilis and Latin and Goyim and Hebrew. And it tells you very clearly that the, even the house of Judah called themselves the Goyim. Don't anybody tell me that there's a difference between Gentile and Jew. The only difference is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Paul was going to the 12 tribes. James wrote to the 12 tribes. All right? And that's what we're to seek first. His kingdom law governance be restored. We're to be a holy priesthood, a royal and holy nation. All right? He's not coming back until he has a church without spot or wrinkle. We're to gather every seventh day of the week. We're to gather not just with our families. We're to gather with the assembly of believers. We're to call others out to the assemblies. That's part of the commandment too. It says proclaim them as holy convocations. The word ecclesia is the word for church, right? And that's the word for holy convocation in Hebrew. The calling of others out. If you're in his ecclesia, his church, you're calling others to the feasts. That's the definition. Like it or lump it, you got to call others out to the feasts and the Sabbaths. Then you know, then you even have the word church in any of its application in anywhere in the scripture. Paul said, let us keep the feasts of unleavened bread, not with the old leaven. We have the new leaven of, or the unleavened, uh, yeah. But we are in the new, in the richness and the fulfillment of it. 
and it won't be fulfilled until after he says not even after heaven and earth passes away it still won't have been fulfilled there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and some sort of thousand generations we've only had near a hundred generations since Adam not even a hundred all right depends what scale you want to go on but it's definitely not hundreds and it's not thousands we don't see the law fulfilled yet still has a long way to go we just have a very uh, blip in the time and scale of things where people are thinking they don't need to keep it believe you me there was always independent bishops Rome the Bishop of Rome was always considered just an equal bishop of all the Coldy priests Coldy means an ancient priests all right and they were everywhere too and to believe you me Colombo from Scotland and England all of his bishops he put out and later St. Patrick followed in <laughs> and the, the when Colombo visited Switzerland he went and he got these people all on board they understood the whole thing they were independent but when Rome started to exert power Rome started to say you must be it wasn't until like the 10th century they started to say oh you had to be in a Roman form in any way shape or form but Scotland and all these other nations they continued to resist and I can show you many that show many different historical writings that show for the most part people were still keeping the seventh day up until around the 1500s all right and that's when they really started tapping down even harder and they went and they in in uh, the, the, the papacy went and burned this one priest at the stake for preaching that it's okay for a priest to marry all right well that was just the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in the 1400s when he was burned at the stake and it started the first war all right and these uh, these uh, Catholics tried to make some new law that says that priests can't have children they can't marry and all this other stuff but believe me the Protestant Reformation just took off then they burned this priest at the stake and left his orphans out there without a father but uh, Yahweh turned that into a blessing and you know the descendants of his whole line found it and they were part of the, the Protestant elite after that war they actually uh, got in the peace treaty that they had to pay all this money to the orphans of that priest and they were later all descendants uh, and were the uh, the uh, principals and the the university professors and presidents over all the evangelical Protestant churches of Germany okay so Yahweh turned that one into a blessing and uh, always whenever whenever evil tries to go against righteousness it loses big time every time it always turns into something more good for the righteous and so just we should rest in the truth of Yahweh what he says is honor everyone knows what honor is definitely it's not what people are saying on TV is honor <laughs> you know some of the things that they're trying to pass off as honor today where one percent of the population are into the most extreme immoral acts and now they say oh you have to promote it transgender history month oh you have to celebrate the achievements of the homosexual and transgender and lesbian and gay okay This dishonor has been placed upon our father and our mother. Okay? We have to just promote repentance of all sin equally. It's not one sin I'm going to attack. We have to equally mention all sins, but I'm just getting into one where they have this new extreme radical law where no psychologist has reviewed such a law political force the beast system is forced in such a law and they don't even know what kind of identity crisis are going to happen among the straight people celebrating this in their school and redefining the definition of father and mother redefining the definition of even man and woman I mean 
Not to mention marriage and, uh, you know, all these other things they're trying to do. Imagine, and they haven't even begun to calculate, and it'll take another hundred years to calculate what can happen. Because they're all so slow at calculating this kind of stuff. These scientific studies and so forth. And they won't fund these scientific studies. They're just going to sit out there and give them all the pills. Lots of money for us. You know, 30%, actually, more than that. A good majority of the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry holds up the stock market itself. And then their insurance companies that they're in league with, and they actually hold up the stock market. So if it turns out there's more illnesses and more sicknesses, more diseases, I mean, then they make more money. You see, smoking didn't cause that much cancer compared to homosexuality. The biggest study ever done just showed in one form of cancer, all right, that they're 35 times more likely than straight men to get cancer. It's not counting the women who do such things as well, okay? It's, all sin has to be spoken out equally, and we do that. We hold seminars that show each and every sin how it's scientific and God's law is scientific, whether it be the dietary laws, whether it even be the feast days and the Sabbaths, how creation honors Yahweh's days. Okay? We don't uh, attack one sin or the other, but when it starts to say, well, this act, that uh, uh, act against the physical body or impaling or whatnot, the human physical flesh, that's not going to be good for, and you know, all the things and all the diseases that happen. And if you look at a, a normal scale and make a comparison with other people, you know, you're always punishing it. There's no good in, in that kind of a punishment. So we hope people repent of all sin turn away from it totally, 100%. And tell Yahweh, I love you and I love your law. It says you must agape Yahweh, not agape the world. You know what agape means? Unconditional love? It says you cannot please Yahweh if you agape the world. You have unconditional love for the, for the, the seeing of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. All right? Only when you agape, not those things, but you agape Yahweh and his word. You say, Yahweh, I'd love to do whatever your word says. Okay, that's when you have done the basic first commandment. And you trust him that his word is correct. And you obey, you go, and you do what's just your basic duty. We're to teach as priests the difference between clean and unclean. If you're dirty, don't come bring that in. That's not honorable. When would that be honorable? Okay? We don't have to touch on that too much. The cleanliness laws is uh, gone into detail, as well as what Paul taught to the Gentiles in a recent uh, lesson I have done. You can look it up on ChristAssembly.com, how Paul taught we must keep the law. Yes, uh, a full uh, detailed study on what he laid down for the Gentiles, that they needed to keep the Levitical blood laws and they needed to keep the dietary laws. Yes, just so they can do well on the earth. But we are to teach all of his law and people to repent and to turn from it. We are to restore honor, and one of the ways we're going to restore honor is just by keeping these basic commandments. Come on, trust Yahweh. Come on out to the feast. If you haven't done it, do it. Try it. Get on board. It, we all fall down. We all sin. We all fall short. You know, but we got to get back into the race. We don't stay falling down. We don't stay falling short. We get back with Yahweh, and we fill his storehouses. It says you give an offering, okay? And you make it so his house is full, okay? And the storehouse is where you're going to get your spiritual groceries, where you're going to get it. And you give to Yahweh your 10% of your gross pay, not the net. 
because everything that comes to you comes from Yahweh every good thing and wherever you get your spiritual meat you are to provide for that storehouse it's just as important as physical meat and we might even teach you a few things about physical as well with our nutritional experts and so forth but today we're going to really uh, pray uh, for honor to be restored in the land so if you will join me in prayer Almighty Heavenly Father Yahweh we just pray for our father and our mothers we pray against what's happened in this sinful and adulterous generation in many realms many types of sins that have been imposed upon them as dishonor has been imposed and placed upon them dishonor against your word against goodness against your truth oh Yahweh we pray for a restoration of your word and your law in the earth we pray that people will turn from their wicked ways confess their sin we pray that more people will do these basic things which is true honor you were the most honorable one and your beard was pulled out you were spit in the face that's what true honor is going to be like you told us if they try to kill you that they will try and kill us so may your people understand it has nothing to do with the world's definition of honor but true honor which you call your word so I pray O oh Yahweh more people will come to your word that we'll reach more people with seminars with pilgrimages to the places you are placing your name that we will bring about more people that we will assemble under the heraldic ensigns just as commanded doing only that which is our duty to do that we will call more people to the feasts and to the sabbaths that they will come weekly if they don't have an assembly maybe they can join with us on the live online broadcast and that everyone is calling local assemblies praise Yahweh we thank you for your clear way that you've given us these are called your feasts not our feasts Leviticus 23 you told us they are your Moedim and we are to proclaim them forever throughout all of our generations forever we thank you for them that many other assemblies are keeping them together with us now and on where 90 percent of the time the Judaic calendar is correct but this time it is not so we thank you for giving us your correct calendar that we can worship you and honor you and your definition of honor and everything will default back to the true honor so we thank you almighty heavenly father Yahweh that you have so blessed us that we can be a part of true honor and how it's going to be restored the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force you said we'll be attacked but we must be on guard with our heavenly armor may we be ready to stand in that great day may we watch you told us to pray to watch and to pray and to keep our raiment to keep our garments that we do be not be found naked and bring a shame you told us to watch and be praying always that we might be worthy to escape the things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man oh Yahweh may we have that honor may we have that basic and small blessing and that thing that we can reach if we are so kept in your way that somehow we will not by our own works but your power working in us you told us little children be not deceived he that doeth righteousness is righteous as he is righteous you told us that we have you as our righteousness Yahweh Siskanu and you in us by the power of the Holy Spirit by true grace charisma the power to do things 
the power to keep your word that they didn't have in the Old Testament. They had those hardened hearts. Now we love your word. Now we have it written on our hearts, our attitude of love and respect towards all of it. We thank you. You've given us now that new heart so we can love your word. And we can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, you Holy Spirit, we ask you for strength and power to obey your word more this day. We ask forgiveness of sin as we approach you to take of your the body and bread, the, the blood and the wine, the symbols of your sacrifice at the cross. Oh, Yahweh, we just uh, ask for your help. We ask for forgiveness of sin. May your blood wash us and cleanse us. We thank you that you are perfect and that we are to partake of your perfection. You told us that we are to eat your flesh and drink your blood. You are the eternal Elohim. You are the true source of every piece of life and how we must take of you the true tree of life. We pray for the blessing upon the unleavened bread. We pray for your blessing upon the wine that it might convey the reality behind these symbols. We don't take of it unworthily. We place, we place great worth. We place great value upon that sacrifice you made for us and what you called at the Last Supper the cup of the new covenant, that is your resurrection blood when you poured the white wine. The resurrection light that will now flow through us. You said we have no life in us unless we eat your flesh and drink your blood. So I praise you and thank you for that honor to go in your resurrection power that you've purchased for us. And when you spoke and breathed upon the apostles that they might receive of the, your spirit, before the Holy Spirit came after your ascension on high. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit came and filled everyone at Pentecost. We look forward to restudying that whole principle, but we thank you that we have this whole reality now. At the next feast coming up at Pentecost. O oh, Yahweh, we receive your blood sacrifice, your life source. You told us the life of the flesh is in the blood. And we receive your body that was broken for us, wounded for our transgressions. We receive that by your stripes we were healed. We let it be what you say it is. We don't add anything to it. We don't take anything from it. Oh, Yahweh, we just worship, honor, and praise you to whom all honor, glory, and blessing is due. This day, gathered together in your church body, the assembly at the feast, the holy convocation, the ecclesia. We worship you and honor you, praying that your kingdom come will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. And we continue to seek it first. That finally, you said, the end can come once we've been a witness of that kingdom to all the nations. That day is soon coming. We thank you for the many great days of victory coming up. Praise be unto your holy name. We trust, believe, honor, and have faith in your word. Amen. Praise Yahweh. Let's now uh, have the taking of the bread and the wine.